Hello, my name is Laurent Vallas Jr. I'm the writer and creator of the series Sacrifice. My Instagram and Twitter handles are always be evil underscore between each word. You're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic writer and creator and all around amazing person that he is. I happen to have read both of his issue one and two of the comic Sacrifice. We are joined today by the ever talented Laurent Vales Jr. How are you doing today? Hey, thank you for having me. Love the comic. Got to read through both issues. You have a Kickstarter ongoing. We're going to definitely dive into all of that stuff here. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're all about. Well, my name is uh, Laurent. I am a uh, 32-year-old comic writer. I've been writing since I was 18. Got to admit, some of my earlier stuff wasn't really too good, but uh, you know, I, I had some fun with it, a lot of learning. Uh, really got deep into my character writing when I was in the army. My job was a behavioral health technician, so I got to really understand how people worked. I feel like that's kind of what led me to feel right more believable characters, which if you read my stuff, you'll see like, okay, despite how zany all the stuff going on is, there's some like, okay, this, this feels very human for how they act. It's kind of what I pride myself on. Got out of the army, did a little bit more writing for a web comic I had, then eventually went on to the point where I'm like, let me start putting out something through Kickstarter so I have some physical hero or sacrifice into the third installment of the series. So how did being in the Army, uh, the Army and creativity doesn't usually seem to go hand in hand, but I, I'm glad that you found a way. How did that help you become a creative person? Because you said you were a behavioral psychologist. My job is behavioral health technician. So anything from like as low as like minor anxiety to I want to kill myself or people around me. I'd handle like therapies and stuff with those people, a lot of intake stuff. The more extreme stuff, I wouldn't really touch. It'd be the providers. And the way it translated to comics is I was writing stuff. And I had one of the providers there who was a, uh, she was a psychiatrist, uh, but who delved into work in psychology. Like we were interested in certain things. I told her some of the stuff I was writing. It was really harsh criticisms, but needed. And she's like, why would this happen? Why would this happen? It really kind of got me down to like, she she gave the examples of like we're working in a field where you see how people act and you kind of find out more about them and like okay their past behaviors influence how they act in the future is this believable based off their other story of like their upbringing does this make sense or how they got to this point and it really made me sit down and be like okay I like character written uh, character driven stories and this is the perfect type of job learning experience to get to the most believable things because you'll see someone in a comic or a story or whatnot we're like oh they're robbing the bank well if that's just the baseline of it then that's whatever it, if you go further into it like okay now we need to make it believable because no one just wakes up tomorrow morning is like oh man i, I could really go for a uh, hundred dollars in my account to help pay for this let me rob a bank no there's just a series of events that happen in your life to make you get to the point where like that's okay so doing that you know a lot of therapies and like kind of really seeing how people worked uh made me Put like a really high emphasis on everything I'm going to do. I, I really like character driven things. Everything I need to do like needs to make sense to who they are, where they came from, what they believe. Those years of doing that really helped me uh, hone in on what I wanted to see in my writing. But that's the the hallmark of good writing, though. You, you know, you, you see the masters in prose and in um, not only science fiction, but in, in reality in terms of real-time writing situations where they they understand the people and they make their characters believable. And the fact that you're doing that with the characters that you have, some more fantastical than others, are still relatable in some way, shape, or form. Hey. Looking then, because you have three issues on, currently, is, is this the end of the series or are you going to keep going with it? Because I, I it sounds like you have a, a ton you can add to this particular series. This is the first arc. Uh, where the first like like complete storyline, you still follow characters later. Where I can end it, there's a couple logical ending points I have. I'm just gonna be really dependent on how well the series does. If it's like, hey, this is doing really well, I can keep going for like long periods of time. Then all right, I'll explore a lot of the ideas I have, but there's still is, like a definitive ending. Or on the other end, where it's like, you know, I've had two successfully funded campaigns. This one's like exceeding this goal significantly. So like, if it's like, all right, I can do enough but not enough for like me taking care of my own personal stuff and making the comic doesn't really work out, then I can logically end it at 12. It's not really where I want to, 
but I can have it, which at the end of the day, you know, I'm writing stories and people are, are reading them and they're enjoying them. And despite what I have going on, like my personal stuff, like I want to give a completed story to people. So if 12 is where I have to end it, I'll end it at 12. If not, I can go, you know, a bit further. And if it's just doing great, then like, okay, I can go for a, I can go for a good bit. I did the math for it. If I can, if I explored like every idea I had, I was like, this will be really fun. It won't overextend the story for a stay. Perfect scenario, maybe 30 issues. And I, I don't even see myself getting that far, but that's just if it's like, I have all the freedom in the world to do everything. If not, I can be more conservative. Like I'm kind of planning to than around 20. You have goals. That's the main thing. The fact that you don't want to leave things on cliffhangers is commendable. So I, I appreciate that as a reader. So thank you for that. And the fact that your your current Kickstarter campaign, which is ongoing, is funded and you're looking like you're going towards more stretch goals, which is amazing. When is the Kickstarter ending, actually? Uh, if I remember right, it's not this... Uh, Tuesday coming up, but the Tuesday after. I think there's 11 days left in it. Uh, well, this campaign's the uh, third one because I had a campaign for just the first issue by itself. And for so, each time I have an issue coming, I'll do one. So w what did you learn then from the very first Kickstarter you did to now that didn't realize when you first started? Be present on social media. <laughs> is Because I never really use Twitter or anything. Like I'm, I'm very to myself for a lot of things. I was like, all right, yeah, I, I have a social media. Let me kind of do it. And then the first one did well enough. And the second one, I got more support from people I didn't know uh, versus family, which to me, I feel is more success because people, you know, will, you know, they'll throw money at your thing like one time or whatever, try to help you get up, you know, ground. But the next time it's like, all right, the people who don't know you, don't have any connection to you, have no reason to support you are doing it for the reason they actually enjoy it. I really contribute to me really pushing at my social media presence. So it's like, all right, I'm, I'm putting myself out there. More people know about me. I'm growing, growing, growing that. And I didn't really... It's not that I didn't know it at first. It's just I'd never done any of the legwork ahead of time. Fast forward for my second one and the third one. If I remember last time I saw it, I was 159 backers. My last campaign, I had 160 at the end, 11 days left, and I'm one backer away from uh, from reaching where I was at before. Learning to actually put an emphasis, you know, schedule how how much I put myself out. So I'm not knowing about putting myself out often enough, which life's crazy right now so i'm not even doing as much as i i want to but uh but it's still all working out for the best well and what's the hardest part about being a, a, a writer is it the beginning the middle or the end when you start writing a, a sacrifice episode oof uh the hardest part i think the hardest part would probably be like just the middle area because the way i like to write arcs in anything is i, I build it everything from like a skeleton where it's like okay I have my characters, I have who they are. And I, I mentioned that I like myself being very character driven. And I don't like the stuff that kind of like goes on and goes a little bit too far. So like I want a definitive ending. And that's why I did that with multiple arcs. And even in the multiple arcs I had planned out, there's a couple of points I'm like, I can logically end the story here if I change this thing, or this thing, this thing. Or if it's doing well, I can just leave that out and it can continue. So I have my definitive beginning and ending. And I do it based off of a story arc. So now I'm like, okay, cool. I have my beginning issue one, end of issue six, because I have six issue uh, arcs. Now I need to have logical points to get from the beginning to the end, while also having like, you know, multiple, like five different ending points where like I can break an issue at that would be a satisfactory ending. It's just like a lot of like fine tuning, which it's not too difficult sometimes until I get to the issues with a lot of action where it's like, I need some substance in here. I can't have I can't have too many pages of action because I need something something in there like to you know carry the story forward. Otherwise, I get to the next issue. It's like okay, now I have to do a, a dump of lore, which is just a slog to read through. So when I get into that middle point of like, uh, how can I do that? Issue three was hard to write with that. I, I was able to get the action and I was able to get in when I needed to, but that was uh, definitely one of the harder ones. Was like mm, I know where I need to get to, but how can I get there? Putting the right amount of information so it's not too much or too little. Out of these three issues, then what was the hardest scene for you to write? The hardest scene to write in these first few issues, huh? Oh, okay. issue two. There's a, a vampire woman and a, a mage who talk to each other in issue two. And the first time I scripted it out, I'm like, I need to have a certain tone where the vampire character is like, okay, the girl with the, uh, with the magical book, she's, she's brand new to the group. She doesn't really know anything going on. The vampire character is, she's very close to the main character, uh, Damien. She's not really trusting of other people like that. So you have someone who's new coming into the group and it's like, okay, I need to, I need to write in a way where you can see that there's that 
she doesn't like hate her or anything like that. She's like, I'm, I'm kind of wary about you. We have our own ways of doing things. You're brand new to this. And when I was writing that the first few drafts, I'm like, man, she's coming off like asshole. Like, how do I, how do I get that right without where it's believable, but it's not too much. Cause like, I, I, I want my characters to be likable. There's certain people I'm like, you can be unlikable. Cause that's what I want from you, but not for my main character. So I think that was like five or six drafts before I was like, okay, I'm, just for that scene, like the rest of the comic, I was fine with. I just kept redoing that one scene. It's like before I'm like, okay, you know what? I think I got it. And then issue three, I kind of expounded upon that more. But because I had more than just like, I think I put gave that two pages in issue two. I have more time with that. I was like, all right, now I can really flush that a bit more. So now you can get more of it and see how they interact a little bit better. And and now I'm happy with it. But those two pages of like slamming my head against the wall, I'm like, man, how can I make this work without making you look like an asshole? So then what did, what did you edit out of the book? Uh, it's not really that I edited out because everything was the same. It's just the flow of dialogue I changed because it, it still kept the tone. I don't remember what I had in there initially, but it, like, it had the tone of like, okay, you know, you're here. I'll trust you as much as Damien needs us to trust you, but I don't expect too much for this one. And, and I use that to really transition from that conversation into one of the other main characters, Axel, which you see kind of take center stage in issue two. And that was a real natural conversation point, kind of building him up to then right after that, seeing what he can do. Basically just a, a change in dialogue and, and working the tone of that out. So it changed like, okay, now this is more reasonable. What theme spoke with you uh, throughout the series that you're currently writing? So there's a few touch close to home and I, none of them in the first arc, the second arc, were, which would be like issue seven through uh, 12 when I get to that it gets a heavy emphasis on, okay, like, what do you believe in? What do you think is right for you? Um, what if other people tell you that's wrong? And that kind of comes down to the experience I had when I joined the army, because I hit a point where I was working at a grocery store, living with my parents at like, how old was I? I was at 23 at that point. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm doing this, this, this. I'm not really having any plans to better myself. Like nothing, nothing was really there. I was like, if something happened to me tomorrow, I'd have nothing to show for it. And like, really just like deep like self look at myself and like what can I do to make myself better what is the chance I think I can take and whether certain people believe it or certain people didn't it was like I, I did what I felt was right that's a big thing that goes into the second arc I won't say who it focuses around but you'll uh, you'll definitely get that and the other thing is I mean it's a title of sacrifice but a lot of it comes down to personal sacrifices some of these characters have made which I won't go into too much because it'll you know spoil some things but once you get to explore more of these characters, like, okay, how this is how they got to this point in the story. This is why they went from doing their own thing to working with the main character. You get to see a lot of things like, okay, this is their situation. This is the challenge they had to deal with. And this is like, this is exactly like, and it's never like a hit in your face. It's there. And someone picks up on it. Cool. If not, you know, that's cool too. It doesn't really take away from the story, but it's like, okay, I can see what he was doing there. Now looking at names names are always interesting i find namology of characters when it comes to the creation of of any medium no matter what it is fascinating because a name sets the tone of of what you're looking for and the fact that you have some historical or mythological figures in there as well too with names that we're familiar with is fascinating but how about some of the names that you came up with during this the series so far some of them it's like really simple um where there's not really that much to it like damien like they usually hear that as far as when it comes to like the andy christ or the demon so I, I got that name there um others are like you were inspired by something that was actually in some type of source like one of the main characters uriel which is you are family uriel then others i came down to i worked with my artist and i created a character or even before i created a character with them i envisioned how i wanted them to look and it was as simple as like, all right, looking at this person, like what would be like a natural name? I'd see like, okay, I could see you, you know, walk away. Like, this is what you'd be named. Like, this is what you would look like to me. Like, you know, and just saying, you say like, hey, you look like you'd be a John. Like, I mean, I, I've never said that, but like, that's usually a thing. So I'd like, I look at some of the characters, like just seeing how I envision you, this is the name I'd be like, okay, I could, I could see you going by that name. You mentioned your artist and, and we, we would be very remiss if we didn't talk about your artist. Uh, who is the artist, of course, in your series, uh, or if you have more than one, let me know so far. And how did you find them? So his name is uh, UJ Chen. And I found him through Facebook, which I know I didn't, I meant I didn't really do Facebook, social media, 
but I joined that group for my first like web comic. It was like, okay, how do I, how do I find artists? I, I didn't really know any other source, so I just used that. And it wasn't actually for this project. It was for something else I was going to do, but I ended up dropping to do this, which I put out there. I was like, Hey, I'm uh, trying to do this. My goal is getting into the industry at some point, but uh, for now I'm going to you know, just make a comic series. And I put up like a bunch of uh, requirements and things I was looking for. And I got like a hundred uh, responses to that. I'm like, Jesus, this is a lot of people. I was like, all right, you know, people want jobs, this is cool. After that, I whittled it down to like the top three. I'm not the type of person who's like, has like, you know, grandiose ideas for like all the things I can achieve. But like, I legitimately believe that sacrifice the series and go places if I get enough eyes on it, if people like really start getting into it. That plus the amount of like energy and effort and everything I put in the store, I wanted someone who could match that. So I had the top three. Uh, one of them, honestly, I couldn't remember off the top why I didn't choose them. The other one, like his art was good. It came across when we were talking, like, yeah, I'm doing this as like a job, which is like, a, a, that's fine, but there's not really any passion there. And then I talked to UJ, who, and it felt like he matched my energy on everything. It's like, he wants to get into Marvel. I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but what he'd do with his pages is he'd draw a page. If he didn't think it's something that would make it into Marvel or DC, he'd scrap it and start over again. Like he genuinely believes in himself like the same way i do in myself I was like okay this is like a match made in heaven uh, that's the same way he made my colorist too like he was on that website i mean he responded to like that other job but then we transitioned from that to doing sacrifice and it's been a fantastic ride since then what was it about then the style of music that's the funny part because despite all the demons and monsters and series he'd never drawn any of that before before the series hmm. like i said this is, we were working on something else together already knowing the type of person he was how far he wanted to go like he gave me my own little quiz. He's like, "Hey, so what happens if you, this one doesn't succeed? What's your what's your goal?" I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, if this doesn't succeed, my dream's still writing comics. So I'll just feel like I need to write something else, put it out there. So I'll just move on to the next story." So like he, we already knew we lined up along the way. So I'm like, "Hey, I'm writing this story instead. I know you kind of helped me with this pitch for that, but what about this one? And we can continue this on for a bit." He's like, "I mean, I've never drawn monsters, but I'm willing to do it." Knowing the type of person he was, I had full confidence that. He would, and he's done like an outstanding job on it ever since then. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? There are certain areas, especially when I was doing that job before, which I wouldn't say negative. I'd, I'd say positive in an aspect of like really making me just understand things is a lot of things come out of word choice because, you know, the English language is like very complex. There's a million ways to say the same type of thing, but swapping out a word or two can change the connotation that significantly. I know there's a lot of times I was doing interviews with people, like in tech interviews, seeing their side of the story, what was going on. And certain times I describe stuff and one or two words can like really make you pick in on something. It's like, okay, it could be from someone that was like, hey, my commander taught me or told me I uh, need to come here. And they didn't really seem like they want to be there. But then picking up on some of their word choices, like, okay, you worded it this way. Let's talk more about that. And then going from that point to, Oh, you know, you're, you're saying initially that you don't really want to be here. You're, you're just kind of forced to be here to like, okay, now we're seeing where this is going because of your word choice. I was able to dig up more stuff and find out that you actually have a lot of problems at home. You don't really feel any value in life. Like, so uh, positive in the sense is like, that has helped me significantly as far as talking to other people there. It's not so much of the comic side. I, I guess it is when it comes down to learning how to write uh, dialogue specifically, because it really tells you, lets you know the power of like, okay, adding this word in here or even swapping that word can like add a lot of depth to what you want to say and what you really mean. So then what was the first thing that you wrote that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? That was my webcomic series, uh, War, where looking back at it now, it's, it's it's not great. It's not bad. I like, I reread it after each show friends were interested in my stuff. It let me know I knew how to choreograph action scenes pretty well. It let me know I know how to introduce characters. Like, there's certain aspects where it's like, okay, yeah, dialogue was oof, it, exposition a plenty uh, in that, which, <laughs> which I'm not really uh, a fan of. But I was like, I don't know how to write all these things that I want to say. Uh, I didn't really understand the concept of like, you know, limiting how much dialogue you have on a page. But I was like, uh, you know, it, it's it's for the story. People liked it. Like, I had a I had a good number of people who were like really into it and following it week by week. It was on a uh, tapas. The IO, which is a webtoon site. And I just got a lot of positive feedback from it. I, there was some negative here and there, but like it was like overwhelmingly positive. For me, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm in my mom's house jotting down notes, scribbling stuff like this is however many years ago that was. I was like, if people like it, clearly I'm doing something right. 
And I just need to expound on what I was doing right and fix the things I was doing wrong, which is, you know, an ever present journey. Like I'm still not the writer I want to be. I feel like I can do so confidently. If you're like, hey, I want you to write a series in this and this genre following X or Y characters, then I feel like I could do it. But I mean, there's always stuff that I, I can improve on. I need to get better on it. So then what is your creative kryptonite? There's stuff I want to write involving like mystery. There's stuff I, I like as, as far as the theme or like I really like something that kind of keeps you at the edge of your seat. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm horrendous at that. Uh, I thought about doing it. I was writing it down certain areas. I was like, man, this is really dumb. Let me, let me just write some comedy action thing. <laughs> and, like, and that's how it comes to the scene. Like even uh, it, there's a character after you read the ending of the issue too, where it's like, oh, something's, something's set up here. The way I handled it was like, you get the information. It, there, there's some intrigue, some mystery behind it. I was trying to do like a full-fledged mystery scene. I wouldn't ask my family to support that because I'm pretty sure I couldn't do that really well. One day, maybe once I get a, a bit better, uh, I'll, I'll explore something like that. But that, that's where I am, like uh, writing a, a good mystery is that no one, no one would back that. How many half-finished scripts do you have? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I think I, I talked to someone about this recently. As far as like just stories in general that I have, there's got to be like, maybe like 18 oh, okay. as far as the ones that like i'm like okay these are the ones i actually put time into like you know sacrifice type thing maybe four or five when i was younger i didn't play a lot of just like general writing like hey i'm really interested in stuff and I write to a certain point and i will never do any of that stuff to my you know intent now because that was before i understood that hey Publishers kind of want stuff with like a decent length. Not that I counted the issues, like an 80, 80 page or 80 issue uh, epic following these characters. Like what Madman is going to give a first time writer that? No one. Those were written when I was younger up to a certain point. Uh, unless I became like the biggest writer on earth, I'd never see any of that getting picked up. So I never really expended the energy towards that. Outside of that, once I hit a certain point in my writing, I became really consistent in the sense of I don't like starting something and not at least finishing an arc or getting to a certain point. Like I know what I'm going to do after Sacrifice. Uh, once I finish the first arc, there is another story I have planned out. And it would be like a three-issue miniseries. It's not written yet. It's planned with me having that in mind where like this is what I'm going to try and do. While I have other ideas that I could go back to and explore because they, I feel like they would work the format I want. Until I'm done with that one, I don't want to move on to the next one because I've had a lot of friends who I've seen fall into that trap. It's, it's easy to have an idea. It's the easiest thing on earth. It's the hardest to actually stay committed to it for the length that you need to. Hmm. From when I was younger, it was pretty bad. When I got to the point where I was confident in like how I wanted to write, uh, that no longer became a problem because I would only focus on one thing until I got to like, this is a strong ending point, then move on to the next. I mean, you're, you're seeing the, the pitfalls of, other writers you're making sure that you don't do that and that's you know, you're already setting yourself up for success either either way so that works out do you believe in writer's block yes uh i do i've had points where it's not that i couldn't write anything at all because i could make i could write something um but i've had points where i'm like okay i don't have any real ideas right now and i'm forcing it but i know the quality of this is significantly less than it would actually could be um, and like my point for that is I literally stepped away from writing for a bit. Like, cause you know, I'm not like doing this as, like a full on career. So I have that luxury and I came back to it, like refreshed with like, okay, I, I'm, I'm good to go now. And I just wrote as it was, but, uh, as far as the concept goes, yeah, I, I do believe it's a thing at varying levels. There have I been at the level where like, I couldn't write anything at all period. No, but just because it hasn't happened to me, I'm not going to say it's nothing. Is there any, anything I haven't touched on that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? If you're at a point where, and this is where I was, this is my biggest fear starting this, is the fear of failure to an extent where or not, you know, you're putting your eggs in this basket. You're really hoping like, hey, I want to put a campaign on Kickstarter. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if it'll be successful, which is where I was. I, mean, I didn't have any social media presence. I just had friends and family. Like I, I have a lot of confidence in this. I, I know sacrifice is a story that can go places, but you could have a great story on earth, but if no one knows it's out there, what does that amount to? So there's a lot of fear with that. And I, you know, I put it out, I did everything I could. And it's just a lot of like, if you're worried about it, then just, I mean, just go for it. What's worse than attempting and not making it is not making the attempt and years later, regretting that because that regret doesn't go away. 
if sacrifice didn't work out or, you know, there's still a few more issues coming out and while it looks like I'm posed to be in a good position for getting those out, if it didn't, I'll at least know that I put something out. I tried my hardest and, you know, th- that I can carry with me. I can be happy about versus, oh, I, I put this aside years and years past. I can't really do it anymore. Just go for it. Have faith in yourself. Have confidence in yourself. If it's the first thing you ever wrote, still try. I can promise you the first thing you write would not be anywhere near as good as what you can write a few years later, but it's all a process. Just keep working at your craft and you'll make it. You know, you'll find other people online who are in the same boat as you. They'll support you. You support them because that's how this industry works. And that's the best, that's the best thing for us to so just go for it. At what point are we good enough? In my opinion, uh, never. It, it comes down to like, are, are you good enough to write a story? Then that's a different story. If you're good enough to like reach your ultimate goal, like I plan and hope to always improve in some way, shape or form. I don't see a, a world where like there's a perfect me as a writer. There's always something you can do better. While I feel like I'm you know, good enough to put out a story, if I feel like I'm good enough as my point of writer, then then no, because at that point, I don't think writing would be fun anymore because I want to get to a point where like, I'm doing this better, I'm doing that better. People are enjoying it more and more and more versus like, a, I am good enough, I'm as good as I can be. And then there's no real progress because then, you know, stuff gets old at that point. And uh, why I write stuff that I want people to enjoy and have fun with, I want to enjoy the process too, which I do. What is one mistake that you'll never do again? Uh, having a reward in the same issue. Uh, what I did in my first campaign, I'm like, yeah, I had my whole timeline. Like, I'm a very meticulous person, very calculated with everything. I had a whole breakdown. I was like, all right, I'm going to put issue one here, issue two here, issue three here. This is great. Like I said before, like, I wanted to make sure sacrifice could succeed. The type of thing I liked a lot, I know people like, is being involved with the project. So one of my rewards is like, all right, for, I think it was like five backers, for like, put yourself, like, design a demon that could be in the story. Or have pictures of yourself, your loved ones, sort of be like a background character, like one of the students or one of the demon or one of the angels, and you'll be in the issue, which was great. You know, it really helped me cross over that hump. Problem is, I like to get my comics done before the campaign. We had most of the issues done, but there were certain sections like we can't do anything until we get these rewards back. I'm like, what's a fair amount of time? Not two weeks. Two weeks after the campaign is done is when I need to have this stuff. I'll get the pages drawn. Well, then we ran into issues where like the campaign was done. We had these uh, rewards. It's like, all right, well, my uh, artist, he he works multiple jobs. At least then he did. I got pushed this back like a month because I have a lot on my plate. I'm like, okay, cool. Got that. And there was problems with uh, one other person on our our team where it's like, they had stuff going on. I was like, okay, well, that sucks. But And then there was a printer shortage. So like while I was supposed to get my comic out, I think like June, it wasn't until like August or maybe September. I forgot the time frame was like, Man, I'm like way late and all because I do this now. So I'm still doing the same type of thing. But now it's like, hey, issue three campaign, which is one of the rewards. I think it sold out though. Work with me, design a demon. Of course, it can't be something that exists. Like I, there's a lot of free run. Like I'm not going to put the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man <laughs> Ghostbusters in here. Because like while this is financially helping me, I don't think it's going to help enough for a lawsuit. So I'm going to just <laughs> avoid that idea. You know, it's like, hey, uh, you, you back for this? Cool. Great. Thanks for supporting issue three. That will be an issue four. And with my track record so far, it's like, hey, I, I've shown that I'm getting my issues out. I'm doing consistent. I feel like that built up a little bit of believability in me. So people know, well, they will get that. And if you look back at the past issues, like those things are still there. Doing it same issue, I don't uh, see myself ever doing again. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? The second wisest thing. It's a hard act. I need to think about what the first wisest is <laughs> up there. I'm trying to think it would be first or second. Is my uh, my father was telling me before, like I had mentioned, I wanted to be a comic writer after a couple things. Like I got out of high school, and there's a few things I want to do. It's like, oh, I want to do uh, this for a job. I forgot what the first thing was. I know the second one was game design, where I like was starting to be committed. I was like, I want to be a game designer, and then I went to school for that for a little bit, and found out like how hard it was. And like how few the jobs were, like my teacher who had done some work too. Like I was like one in a graduating class of like 20 something and only like three of us got jobs in the industry. And I was like, okay, well, I, you know, I, so I bailed on that because like, I don't want to put all this time and energy in something that like isn't even guaranteed. Like I get that job. I hopped to a couple things. And then one of them was comic writer and no one believed in me. No one thought I was going to stick with it because I had had a history of that. My dad was the only one when I asked him about that. He was like, was, I'll support you in anything you do. And no matter what anyone says that they think you could do, you know what you can do. You know what you want to do. So above all else, like believe in yourself. 
And that's always stuck with me. And while people were out around me and supporting me now, and it's all great. Like, you know, if you didn't believe me at the time, I don't have to be mad at you. I'm going to hold a grudge and curse you to the heavens. Like having that one person believe in me and like, let me know like, hey, you know, they can all have their own thoughts, ideas. What you know, what you believe is what you in your heart know you want to do. Stick with it. Like that's, I can't say a number, a number, I can't say it's number two because I'm trying to think of what the number one is, but that's the most impactful thing I can think of. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? That would, uh, that would be my father. When I got to the point where I was going to write comics, he was the one. Like it was him all the way who, he didn't even, he didn't know anything about comics. He, it was, this was never something that was like a big hobby of his. He liked comic related stuff, which is what got me into it. He, uh, every day after I got home from after school, we'd watch like the, Spider-Man anime series, Batman anime series, like all that stuff together. But he had no real attachment to comics outside of like watching stuff for me when I was a kid. And when no one else believed that I'd actually commit to writing comics or that I would do it knowing it's a costly uh, venture, uh, he was the one who stood behind me, stood by me and told me to like believe myself amongst anything else. That, you know, he'd always be supporting me. So it would be him. From a professional perspective, you are now three issues into your series of uh, sacrifice and you've had two soon to be three successful kickstarter campaigns in terms of your creative endeavor so professionally you are successful in that regard and i'm sure you'll have many more successes in the future do you consider yourself personally successful not quite yet once i have like a finished arc i mean there's all benchmarks and milestones for me being successful like the highest peak of that is like I'm I'm I've written everything I've wanted to write I, I've achieved all these things and like I've, I'm finally happy with that I feel like there's success milestones like okay I got my first issue out cool fantastic I proved I can you know grow a fan base I proved that I can have a successful thing and once I have issue six out which six is the end of the first arc I feel like okay that's another milestone it's like I I can complete an arc um, so while I've reached some successes. To this point, I wouldn't say a successful person until I get a bit further. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? A lot of stuff, I mean, not even just comic related, but I get to a point where I, I look at it and I see what is it that went wrong with this? Where did I go wrong? What could I do better? And I try and like really circle that around. So when I do look at that, I'm like, okay, cool. Now that I know this, let me implement this into the next thing I need to do and make those changes. Because ultimately, as humans, we're going to fail. Like, that's inevitable. So the best thing to do instead of, you know, being upset, blaming everyone around you or, you know, putting the fault to someone else, seeing what you can control, what you can do, and implementing that so that the failure doesn't have to happen again. And if it does, then just keep repeating that process. Because at one point in time, you will succeed. Doesn't the old adage of if you do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, or is that insanity? Yeah, that's insanity. Okay. But that's why you're looking at things to change and implement versus doing the same thing over and over. Because at that point, then yeah, you're just a madman. Or a comic creator, whatever works. Yeah, one of the same, <laughs> interchangeable. Exactly. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or creative person in some way, shape, or form in whatever they decide to be creative in. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? First, I'd be shocked if I inspired anyone. I'm, I'm early in, but, you know, thank you. Be true to yourself, what you believe in, and what you want to do, and stick with that. Because if you want to try and go out of your way to do something that's, like, not really what you believe in, I don't think that will land home with people. Everything I try to do is I try to have genuine to what I believe, what I think. That's how I carry myself. That's how I pride myself in, like, how I do things. And if that's resonating with people, then outstanding. Be you, be proud and confident in who you are and carry that forward. And then if it reaches people, that's what will reach people because it's genuinely you as a person who's doing these things. Well, I do hate to say this, Laurent, but uh, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, you survived, by the way, so congratulations. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find the Kickstarter? So to find me on social media, uh, I am always be evil underscore between each word on both Instagram and Twitter, though I'm more active on my Twitter. The campaign for Sacrifice Issues 1 through 3 ends on Tuesday the 26th. Yes, yeah, right around the corner here. Well, I want to have you back on the show in the future for sure, so please stop by anytime. You're always welcome. And I... You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website. 
unfortunately, because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on to Geeks Talking.